Let's take a minute and pray God's blessing over his word this evening, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word because it penetrates, Lord. It it divides all that we have to talk about with truth. And uh, Father, tonight we want to unpack this story of the prodigal son. But rather than talking about the prodigal son, which is what most of the messages are in this passage of Luke, we're going to talk about his brother. And... uh, the message that you have for us, at least one of the many messages you have for us, for that family and that story. So Father, thank you for it. Thank you for putting it on my heart. I pray that um, you speak through me and Lord, that folks' uh, hearts are changed as we consider, Lord, how uh, your compassion for us in our suffering brings it all to light. So thank you for this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Okay, so my title of the message tonight is God's Compassion in Our Suffering. And uh, for some time now, as I've gone through different uh, opportunities to teach, whenever I've heard a message or taught on the prodigal son, the story, I always wonder why I don't see more about his brother. And so this time I had an opportunity to talk about his brother. So in in that context, it'll give you a little bit of a, a flavor of where I'm going with this. Luke chapter 15 Uh, Quite a few verses, 11 through 32. I'll read them in a minute. And uh, we're going to talk about that. So just as a way of introduction, I came to Christ as a college student back in 1980. Now, I know that just tells you how old I am, right? But 1980, I came to know Jesus. And there was a part of me at that time that uh, believed that all my troubles and suffering in life were over. (laughs) None of you are laughing. Like, come on. The logic was, I would never want to see a child of mine suffer. So why, why in the world would God want to see a child of his suffer? Why would he want to see that? Seemed logical at the time. Well, one problem is the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verse 4, For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer afflictions. And so it came to pass, as you know. Well, I discovered this, along with many other things, when I was in those early years. God allows trials and suffering, doesn't he? And uh, to enter our lives, seems like in my life is filled with coming out of one, being in a great space, or going into one. And that just seems how life is. And God is using it to draw us closer to him. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why he uses suffering in our lives. So my question then became, why? Why, why God, why do we have to suffer? I've grappled with this question myself over the years at different times, either uh, in my career or mostly as a parent. When I raised seven children, four of them boys, that was really my biggest test. Why does God let his people suffer? Maybe you'll struggle with that a bit too, or you, maybe you already have. So if you've been struggling and, uh, or you have been suffering with something, you've got pain in your life perhaps, unresolved, I don't mean physical pain, but perhaps in your life you came to the right place because tonight we're going to talk about it from God's word, this topic of suffering and God's compassion. People who are angry, I'll add this, people who are angry about having to suffer and blame God really need to view their circumstances through truth, not feelings. We all are guilty. Why? Why, God? Why did you allow that to happen? So we're going to talk about that. And I'm going to read uh, Luke 15, starting in verse 11, if you want to follow along. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. 
Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country. And he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up, came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older, bro- older son was in the field. This be the prodigal's brother. Was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice he says, son of yours, came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes? You killed the fattened calf calf for him. And he said to him, son, you have always been with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. Quite a story. So I say God pursues you with his love and compassion. God pursues you with his love and compassion. All the tax collectors, we understand who those were in the society in Jesus' time. All the tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and criminals and thieves uh, were coming near Jesus to listen to him. So the rabbis began to grumble about this, saying this this fellow welcomes sinners and even eats with them. And when Jesus heard the rabbis grumbling, he decided to tell them this story. So we know this story to be the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal means wasteful. The story of the wasteful son, another way to see it. So let's remind ourselves about the story. There were two brothers. The younger brother took his inheritance and left home, wasted it on wild living. Then he ends up broke, alone, living in a pig pen. And the Bible says at that point he comes to his senses. He repents. He decides to head home to his father. And I believe God is seeking and pursuing all of us. He is seeking and pursuing you. Luke 15, 20 says he was still a long way off and his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him. And the story goes on to say that the father restored him to his full rights as a son, even through a party to celebrate the fact that his son had returned. Now, so far, it's easy for us to identify the actors in this parable. The prodigal son... Who does he represent? Well, he represents all the tax collectors and the sinners who were repenting and flocking to Jesus. 
And how about the Father? He represents God, of course. He provides forgiveness to all of these folks, tax collectors, sinners. He was thrilled to have his son back, wasn't he? So now, honestly, Jesus could have ended this story, and this is where a lot of messages end. You can find countless sermons published on this story. He could have ended the story right there, and it would be and has been a great story with great spiritual truth about how God receives repenting sinners. But if you're here today and you're away from the Lord, you've fallen away from the Lord, let me say to you that if you will make a 180 degree turn, just like the prodigal son did, and you will come back to God, just like the son did, he will receive, you will receive from God the very same kind of reception, the very same kind. He will greet you with open arms, He will take you into his arms. He will embrace you. He will. He really will. He will restore you. He will throw a party for you. The angels in heaven rejoice when you come back. We hear story after story after story of this in our baptism service. The heavens rejoice, as I said, when one sinner repents. The heavens rejoice. Listen. You don't need to clean yourself up. People think, oh, I'm not worthy. You don't need to clean yourself up. The prodigal son didn't clean himself up. He came straight from the pig pen. You don't even need to fix yourself up. The prodigal son didn't. You don't need to. In the same way, pick yourself up. Even tonight, pick yourself up. The prodigal son needs to come back to God in repentance. You might be one of those prodigal sons. At the end of the service, I'll give you an opportunity, a bit unique, but I feel strongly that if you feel like you need to turn and make that 180 degree turn and say, God, please take me back, then I'm going to invite you to come right down here in front of me at the end of the service, right over here by the baptismal, and I'm going to meet you there, and I'm going to pray with you, and I'm going to encourage you right there. We'll come back to that. So I want you to wrestle with that a bit. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst. He's in your midst. A victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. What precipitated this story from Jesus? Why did he tell this story? Well, it was those hard-hearted rabbis who felt no compassion, no pity, no mercy for these returning sinners. So enter character number three in the story, namely the prodigal son's older brother. We're reminded of it in verses 25 through 30 again. Now his older brother was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He refused to go into the house and join the celebration. He refused. The one who squandered his father's wealth, who in the brother's eyes ruined their family reputation all throughout the countryside. He was not on his life was he going to celebrate. So his father comes out. Now my heart breaks when I read the story. I'm a dad and I think about conflicts in the family that need resolved over the years and my heart breaks. His father comes out and says these words. And I feel for this father who's coming out now and trying to beg 
his son, the older brother, to have mercy, to have compassion, to have pity on his younger brother, to show forgiveness and mercy. We talk in our marriage counseling all the time, forgiveness and grace. Are you actively forgiving one another? Are you extending grace? My goodness, God gives us so much more than we deserve, does he not? So much more than we deserve. The brother, all these years, he says, paraphrase, I'm speaking for him. I've been slaving for you, yet you never gave me even so much as a goat. But here your son arrives. Notice, he says, not my brother arrives. Your son arrives. When this son of yours has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you kill a fattened calf for him. Boy, he was angry. It's a call to prodigal sons that need to come home. Prodigal sons that need to come home. Folks, I want you to notice here the key point in the story is this, that the older brother looked great on the outside. He was responsible to his dad. He was obedient to his father. He was hardworking on the farm. He took care of things. He looked great on the outside. He was dependable. But on the inside, something was terribly missing. This prodigal son sees his inheritance gone. This prodigal, beaten up by sin, he's just limped home on his very last leg and his older brother, glad to see him? No. Was he touched at all by his little brother's pain? No. Did he have any pity for his wounded human being? Not once. His heart was as cold as a slab of granite. Do we all see that? Do we? Do you not have compassion on his brother? How are we when we grade ourselves on our compassion for others? High bar the Lord gives us, but he calls us to be compassionate towards others. So that's the salient point of this whole story. So if the prodigal son represented all the tax collectors and the sinners who were repenting and flocking to Jesus, if the father represented our merciful and forgiving God, then church, who does the older brother represent? He's all those folks out in the listening to Jesus talk who gave no compassion, no pity, no interest. Look good on the outside though. Was full of self-righteousness standing there before Jesus but utterly lacking in compassion. Verse 31, then the father said to the older brother, my son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. We had to celebrate and rejoice, he goes on to say. We needed to embrace him. He was dead and now he's alive. Just like these tax collectors and sinners, Jesus abruptly ends the story right there. It just stops. You say, wait a minute. Uh, that's what I did. It's like, wait a minute. What happened to the older brother? The story just ended. Did he not come in? Why didn't Jesus tell him? I hate stories like this like a bad movie what's the problem with this well the reason Jesus didn't finish the story is the ending of the story was up to the rabbis who pay no regard to Jesus it was up to them who were standing there and listening would they come into the party or not would they soften their hard hearts with some compassion and pity for these sinners or not that's who the older brother represented God is teaching us life-changing lessons through our suffering. It's taught me all kinds of things. How would I have learned them had I not gone through it? Jesus was standing there like the father in the story, pleading with them as a father. But how sad it is that most of these rabbis never change their hearts. We are surrounded by people sometimes who have hard hearts, never soften, never soften. God can soften their hearts though, can't he?
But these rabbis did not come into the party. Now that's as far as the passage goes. But then we have to ask ourselves, what difference does this story mean to us? What difference does it make? I'm glad you asked. Honestly, why does God let Christians suffer? Back to the point. Why? At 21 or 22 or whatever I was, I don't, I don't think I understood it. I hadn't lived enough life to truly understand it. I didn't get it. But I'll help you with that. Remember we said a few moments ago that the older brother looked great on the outside. But on the inside, something was terribly missing. Remember, well, let's ask the question. What exactly was missing? It was the same thing that was missing and standing right there in front of Jesus. We can sum it up with one word. The word is compassion. It was missing. There was no compassion. The dictionary says compassion is the ability to identify with people in need or in pain and react in a caring way. I'm reminded of what Jesus said to Philip in John 14, 9. Have I been so long with you and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? You want to see the heart of God? Then all we have to do is look at how Jesus responds in every situation he ever went into. Read them all. Look them all up. Every situation he went into, we will see the heart of God on display. The heart of God is the heart of intense, intense compassion and love, of course. So I reflected on that and I thought, well, why would I have chosen to be a volunteer chaplain with the Hillsborough Police and the Hillsborough Fire Department? Why would I have done that? Did that for six years. It certainly wasn't because I enjoyed tragedy. No. First time I asked a fire chief what he thought about me helping out through con through network I had in the fire service. He said, well, how do you, how do you like death? I was like, well, who likes that? He said, well, as a chaplain, you're going to encounter it almost every time we call you. For some reason, God still drew me in. I still did it. It certainly wasn't because I enjoyed the tragedy. It wasn't because it was cool to be on scene with officers and firefighters, although there are a number of people who think that's pretty cool. It was intense. And most of you know I have a son that's a paramedic and a son-in-law that's a firefighter in Hillsborough. And so it wasn't because I was going to get to hang out with them. Not in that environment. It wasn't because I wanted Sherry and I to be awakened at some ungodly hour to pagers and radios. And she didn't have to get up, but I guarantee she was awake from a deep sleep as I changed clothes and left for an unknown tragedy. Praying all along the way, Lord, what am I walking into? Interacting with an officer or a paramedic on the radio as I drove across town to prepare myself for what was ahead. Why did I volunteer to do those things? I can only say it was compassion for those in our community. It was compassion in the throes of tragic events that people's lives were changed forever it was just my pastoral calling and I found myself doing it in the public's eye look at Matthew 9 when Jesus saw the crowds he had compassion for them because they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd when Jesus went ashore in Matthew 14 he saw a great crowd and had what? Compassion for them. Matthew 20, compassion. James 5.11 says, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. This 
is the heart of God. But the Bible goes farther than that. The Bible not only tells us that God is compassion, but we are to be people of compassion. People of compassion. A few verses for you. Colossians 3.12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. I think he was serious about compassion. We need to be more serious about compassion for others. Compassion for others is a godly trait. And we want to have those godly traits? I want to have more godly traits. There's one you can master right now. Become more compassionate towards others. To sum it up, Peter says, have compassion. Not too confusing to understand what Peter's calling us to. This is why Mother Teresa spent her life working with poor children. Compassion. This is why Cory Ten Boom hit Jewish people from the Nazis in Holland during World War II. Compassion. This is why Wilbur Wilberforce fought his whole life to, and succeeded in ending slavery throughout all of the British Empire. Compassion. This is why Johnny Erickson Tata sends help and encouragement to people with disabilities all over the world. Compassion. God wants you and me to have compassion. And you say, well, okay, I get it. I see it. But pastor, I'm kind of hard-hearted. If you're honest, some of you would tell me that. I'm kind of hard-hearted sort of person. Where do I get this? How do I get this? How do I get more compassion? Is there a book I can read? How about a pill I can take? Maybe there's a seminar you could send me to, Pastor. I'd become more compassionate. By the way, what does any of this have to do with God providing compassion to those who suffer? Just stay with me. I can answer those questions with one verse. Here in 2 Corinthians 1.3. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Compassion and comfort. That's our Lord, amen? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Watch who comforts us in our, what's the next word? Troubles and affliction. In our suffering. In our pain. So that we may watch and learn how to comfort others in affliction. Now, what this verse is telling us is that compassion is a learned skill. This is where it becomes harder for us. It's a learned skill. So that we may learn the verses of how to comfort others in their afflictions. It's a learned skill. How does God teach it to us? He teaches it to us by sending us what? Afflictions, trials, suffering, pain. They happen in our life, do they not? It's suffering that teaches us how to connect with people in pain. It's suffering that tenderizes our hearts to the weak and the needy and the downcast and the helpless, to the poor, the powerless, the orphan, the widow, and the homeless. Suffering tenderizes our heart for those folks and other people in pain more than anything else. I have yet to meet someone who's been successful where success taught them compassion. Actually, we learn it in the furnace, I call it, of suffering and trials. And we have all suffered in different ways, have we not? Bible promises you trials. We have all had trials. I made a list of of a few that were personal to me. 
to illustrate this. We don't get to choose when and how we have pain. We don't get to choose. Loss of work may happen. Reliance on others financially is difficult. Unplanned injuries, unexpected health challenges, wayward children, wounded grandchildren, painful loss of life in the family, unjust and, un and hurtful accusations against you, broken relationships, abandoned Christian friends. What would your list look like? That's a window into my list. What would your list look like? Along the way, each of these has given me some measure of suffering. It's certainly been trials. Each of these has prepared me or equipped me for ministering to others with similar pain. Life experience or loss. There is a reason why God drew, drew us, us, my wife and I, into the counseling ministry of this church. We have had enough life experience to have compassion, to have empathy for those who are going through similar things, to be able to speak to these things, to be able to draw similarities to what people are going through with the scriptures. And for some reason, he's chosen to use us. And we thank him so much for it, even though it is a difficult task at times. But we've been through lots of things. He has equipped us from those things. We've had many successes, but nobody comes to my office and says, I am having a great year. Can we talk about it? I don't get any of those. I get one of those in the coffee line, not in counseling. He has equipped us by putting us through these things, life experiences. Looking back over time, each of these gave God a path to my heart to comfort me, to prepare me, to call me to a greater purpose than the world's measure. Each of these allowed God to abundantly bless me when I trusted him to do it. What I call, I refer to this as putting salve on my open wounds. Putting salve on my open wounds. We each have similar stories. Because everyone here has experienced suffering in some way. You all have a story. Some of you haven't allowed God to put salve on your open wounds. Some of you may even blame God for your suffering. Some of you may not know him personally as Lord and Savior. So my words, this story, makes no sense to you. It's like reading someone else's mail. God is calling you home today. If you've drifted from him, he is calling you home today. May I say to you, if you're here today and you're going through a difficult time, suffering perhaps in your life, painful, some of it's all relevant to your family situation, God's in the midst of it. God's in the midst of it. And I'm here to say that you don't, please don't accept some cheap and superficial explanation for why you're suffering. He's molding you into his image. It's not meant to be easy. Let me tell you why you're suffering. You're suffering because God is not a genie in a lamp. You're suffering because God's greatest goal in your life is to try to take you as his child and build you into a deep man of God, a deep woman of God who knows how to show true godly Christ-like compassion to others and love them. That's why you're suffering. That's why you go through these things. I do have some good news for you and you're thinking, well, praise God, it's about time. You got to some good news. Well, I do have some good news. It's a promise God makes to you and me. It's a promise I've held on all along the way in my life. It comes from Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. 
Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What a wonderful promise. What's he say? Do not fear. Hey, praise God for that. Do not fear. Boy, we're living in times where there's a lot of fear and anxiousness. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do you know how many times God says that to his children in the scriptures? 150 times, roughly. Do not fear. Don't you love it when he starts off saying, fear not. Fear not, for I am with you. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Wow, memorize that. God says, if I have to, I'll pick you up and carry you if I have to. He will do that. But I believe he would say to you, but you're going to make it. You're going to be just fine because I've already inspected what's in your life. You're already a child of God. You've already given your life to me. You can do this and my grace will be sufficient for you, he says. It has always been sufficient. It will be sufficient for you too. I believe he says, I've got your hand. I'm upholding you. I've got you. You're going to make it. You're going to be a better person for the suffering you go through. You're going to be a better husband, a better wife, a better friend. You'll be a better father, a better mother. You're going to be a better coworker, a better sibling. You're just going to be better for it. Fear not. Fear not. Psalm 63. Your loving kindness is better than life. So I will bless you as long as I live. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. Now remember, if you're here and you know God and you're thinking, how do I turn back to him? You can do that. You just have to make that choice. He will show you his compassion. He will demonstrate it to you. You allow him to walk with you through your suffering. I want you to come down front tonight while the worship team, if you want to say, Lord, I'm turning back to you. I just want prayer. I'm turning back to you. I'm here to affirm that for you. No embarrassment whatsoever. Come down and meet me right down here during worship. I'll just give you a few minutes to do so. Some of you might think, hey, I just want to go to the prayer room. I'd like somebody to pray for me. And that's okay too. We have prayer warriors who will be there to meet you. So we're going to take communion in just a minute. But I want to pray for you first. Lord Jesus, I'll bet there's a bunch of people here today who are facing hard times, trouble, suffering, perhaps pain. Lord, it doesn't matter what's causing it. Pain is pain. I pray today that you would encourage and bring hope to our hearts. I pray today that you would lift our spirits. I pray today that you would give meaning to our suffering. Lord, I pray today that you would take any hints from our minds that you have forgotten about us, that you are ignoring us. Lord Jesus, I pray we would have a biblical understanding of why you let your children suffer and that we would be able, even through the pain, to know it's taking us to a place where we will be better. And Lord, I pray that you would remind us of the Bible when it says for our momentary light suffering is producing for us an eternal weight of glory and heaven far beyond our comparisons Jesus remind us there'll be a day when there won't be any more pain there will be no more suffering but right now right now restore hope to us those of us who are suffering those of us who are in pain restore hope to us Help us to trust you more, Lord. Fear not, for your grace will be sufficient because we sat under the word of God today. Lord, I pray and we pray these things in Jesus' name.
And God's people said, Amen.